All right, today it will be Lights, Camera, Active, How to Improve Student Participation and Attendance Rates. So, oh, I'm Catherine Trosel. I've been with you twice now, so it's nice to be back and working with you all um, for our third meeting. So many of you have years, if not decades, of experience in your field. You know your profession, you know your industry, you have the expertise and knowledge to share what you've learned with your students. Okay? That's not the hard part though. That is definitely not the hard part. The hard part is when you get to class and there's hardly anyone there, or if they are there, the engagement is lacking or very limited. So students seem to kind of just be floating along, cruising along, and they're just waiting for that class to be up. And that can be really tough. So what do you do? In my personal experience, I've noticed a trend more with the evening classes to get active participation. They've been at work all day. They're tired, they're hungry. They are just showing up, filling a seat, and they're not actively participating are not actively engaged. And to be honest, we can all relate that is very frustrating, that is very annoying, and that is very aggravating. So, by the time we're done with this training, we are going to discuss ways that we can entice your students to attend class. We are going to discuss ways to organize the class and the time in class in such a way that there is purpose and there is intention to make students want to come back for more. So we are also going to discuss strategies for interacting with students in the classroom so that you are not the only one on the microphone. And finally, you are going to know how to keep the train moving throughout the station and how to keep the momentum going even after the class has ended. So think about students' current level of attendance and participation in your courses. What are some ways that you personally encourage students to attend class? Well, um, uh, for many semesters now, I've been offered the uh, participation grade, but as of late, I've been um, actually making them do things during class to earn that grade instead of basing it on, on just being there. Okay. Yeah, so they'll have until the end of class to show me X amount of progress on, say, the new assignment, or to at least communicate with me visually uh, what their attentions are, uh -huh. and if they do that, then they've earned their participation grade. Okay, so they have to actively work for those points in your right. class, and so that's usually a factor. unless I'm having it's a great. lazy off day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so great, great, it's a great setup. That's for sure. Any other ways that you're enticing your students to attend? Yes. I have six sketch problems, and they're just spaced out for a the semester. They never know when they're going to happen. Okay. And it's worth 25 points for the sketch problem. They have to be in class and actually doing it, and it's made a difference. Right. For, for a lot of. What is the, the, you said a quiz or a, a sketch, sketch problem? A sketch problem. Yeah. Oh, okay, like yeah. a new class yeah. assignment. Yeah, to be here super participating. But you don't have it like planned out under the syllabus, so they don't have, oh, okay. Like a the office. element yeah. of surprise, like, I, like, I yeah. like the element of surprise. Any other ways that you're enticing your students to attend class? If it's the day that uh, uh, work is due, we have a group critique. And they must participate in that group critique for the work to be considered on time. Okay. If they do not, then the work is considered late. Okay. Those are great. Yeah, I know I personally like these new class activities, kind of like the pop quiz idea. They don't know when we're going to do them in that three hour class period. And I tell them um, about going back to that communication thing. I go, if I get there at 6 p.m. and no one's there, you know, I'm going to feel really obligated to go ahead and do that in class activity. And if no one's really communicated with me, then we're definitely doing that in class activity. Now, if you've been communicating with me, maybe I can push that off until 6.30. So yes, that's one of those elements of surprise is a great way. So let's talk about our opening act. So how to, intent, how to entice attendance right away. Think about the last movie that people actually camped out to see. People would camp out 
to see movies and miss work. They would sleep in a tent. It could be hot. It could be rainy. The lines could be super long. Uh, think of the last premiere. The one that I can personally remember was Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And people actually took time out of their day to sleep in a tent to go see the premiere of Star Wars. And um, this <clears throat> is because it created a, satisfy, a satisfying feeling for them. It was going to bring them an immediate value and immediate satisfaction. Students will attend a class if it shows good progress towards their goals and immediate value and immediate happiness. So if it will provide that immediate satisfaction that it's going to solve a problem for them right away, it sounds like something that they just cannot wait to do. They have to do. So, I don't know about you, but this really entices me, a big old juicy burger. So let's address the enticement piece. How do you make your class sound so red hot and juicy that they, you can't wait to get there? They can't wait to show up. So the first thing is we have to get the word out. And when you talk about getting the word out, your class must sound like it is the most incredible blossoming, must-see feature that it really is. It has to be one that make people say, let me pull out the pen, the paper, and popcorn, and let's get started. So how do you remind your students about regular class attendance and what's going to be covered every week? The syllabus outline. Okay, the syllabus outline. I actually don't rely on the syllabus anymore. I, I rely predominantly on Jupiter. Okay. The Jupiter Gradebook system. When I, uh, I don't know what it's called. There's some kind of a splash page where uh -huh. you can, you know, you itemize everything that's going on, all the deliverables. It's all you can Dashboard. snapshot it. Yeah, the splash, whatever it is, it's a snapshot of everything. That's where you put in the dates and what you're going to. Yeah. Do. Yeah. yeah. But when I when I type it in, I also type it in by week because sometimes if you put in a date, the students still don't uh, compute. So I started doing it week one, week two. Mm -hmm. So they know they know when something is due, uh -huh. and um, if a change is made, that's it's, it's usually updated same day to Jupiter. So does it just give like the topics that you would cover for that week in it as well, or just the assignments? All the above. All of the above. Okay. I've been sending like little messages on Jupiter with like uh, I don't know. Here's something that we talked about last class that I told you I would send you. Like it's a radio program or a I've done short the same story thing. or something like that. Yeah. Me you too. know. Um, because didn't videos. you do, I think I got the story idea from you, because wasn't your fashion history class, didn't you have like a, like a, what was it that you did? It was like a special fact every week or whatever. Yeah, remember? I don't, but oh, I mean, yeah. I've, been, I've been trying so many different, I mean, I, we've been doing <laughs> weekly forums, and I've been videoing lectures, and I'll send them like YouTube videos of it, and I'm just trying different like multimedia approaches. Yeah. Um, but the forum's been good, because it's been encouraging people to participate and think about the class outside of class time. Okay. I usually send them home with some kind of current event piece or article that then they have to participate in a forum. Yeah, that's that's good. Is that through Jupiter? Jupiter, yeah. I love yeah. it. It's, yeah. Easy. it's, it's up, really right? easy to manage. It's not everyone uses it. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, if you make it required yeah. for uh, points, uh, they do it. Yeah, it's, it's fun. So let's talk about some ways that we can we, we can spark interest with a session title. So maybe some ways that you can rephrase things that you put in Jupiter or in your syllabus. Pass those down and I'll just put a stack over here for you guys. So we're gonna look at four different approaches on how we can kind of get the word out. And it's going to be using the same topics you teach. We're just gonna wrap it up in a nice, pretty bow. And so the four approaches we're gonna look at is the quick and easy fix, the no fluff, smart and savvy, the play on fear, and the stir drama theatrics. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So let's first take a look at the quick and easy fix. So how to blank in 50 minutes. So we're adding TV drama to the group. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're going to add a little drama to everything in here. These are the days of our life. <laughs> exactly. How to blank in, I'm just going to say, three easy steps. 
How the best blank do blank? How to blank without blank? Three bite-sized tips to blank in under 60 minutes. Three tips to effortlessly blank. Try these three blanks for me and be twice as blank and then one simple rule too. So I took the example of maybe some topics that you would cover in a speech class. Let me show you how I plugged in some quick and easy fixes. So how to make better presos in 50 minutes. How to deliver a speech in nine easy steps. How the best speakers engage audiences. How to answer questions without fear. Five bite-sized tips to design a PowerPoint presentation in under 60 minutes. Four tips to effortlessly practice your presentation. Try these three changes with your eye contact for a week and be twice as effective when you speak. So it's all the outline or topics that you would probably cover in a speech class to begin with. But wow, we just put it in a nice little pretty bow. And this sounds a lot more interesting. And people like lists. So, you know, saying things like four tips to effortlessly practice your presentation. So what I would like for you to do now is in that first box, I would like you to take a moment to create a title for your subject matter for the quick and easy fix. So something that you could take, a topic that you cover in your class and plug it into one of these eight items whichever you choose. And then I'll give you about a minute to do that and I'll have everyone share how they could create the quick and easy fix. For my uh, personal finance lecture, how to invest in five easy steps. <laughs> okay. Well, I made a joke out of one, but then I have a real one. Okay. Uh, how to pass without failing. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, uh, the more reality would be uh, how to study in three easy steps. Paint to create a composition from scratch. It's gonna be about sewing. Let's get going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how to design your own skirt pattern. I told you. Um, how to draw without shame. There you go. Ooh, that's how to cool. draw without shame. Yeah. Awesome. Um, how to nail your intro paragraph in four easy steps. Nice. What tips to effortlessly? <laughs> That all sounds so much more interesting. Yeah. So put that in your syllabus or your outline or your announcements or Jupiter or whatever. Yes, that was awesome. Okay, so uh, can, I, can I change mine? What, what is wrong with yours? I wasn't trying to make it amazing. I was just, I think mine wasn't that amazing either. I thought they were all pretty. How to make Matisse jealous. Ooh, I like that. How to make what? How to make Matisse jealous. <laughs> 
Let's look at the no fluff, smart and savvy category next. So three of the most strategic ways to blink, three actual ways to blink, the go-getter's guide to blink, the no-nonsense blank, three clever tools to simplify your blank, three savvy ways to blink, getting smart with blink, everyone focus on blank instead of focusing on blank, and smart strategies too. So for this one, I had to represent the English life, so I picked it if this was an English class, some topics that you would cover. So 10 of the most strategic ways to conduct library research. The go-getter's guide to writing a killer paper. Three, no-nonsense tips for creating an annotated bibliography. Five, clever tools to simplify APA formatting. Four, savvy ways to check for and correct errors. Getting smart with citing your sources. And everyone focuses on brainstorming boring topics instead of focusing on the unexpected. And then lastly, smart strategies for writing a thesis statement. Okay, you know the drill. Take a moment to create a no fluff, smart and savvy uh, title for something in your subject that you teach. I'll give you a minute to do that, and then I'll have you share. seven actionable ways to nail your business plan and it's seven because there's seven sections yeah, of the paper is. so I break it down to seven actionable ways I like it. Um, in response to number seven getting smart with your final project outline Can you do that? Getting sassy with symmetry. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I love it. That's a, that's a, what's Five no nonsense steps to the fashion figure. Uh, two most strategic ways to get up and get dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's see that part. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone focuses on final drafts instead, focus on the zero draft. focuses on the final floor plan first, focus on the design process first. Thinking you know how to tell if someone will be a criminal? 
Yes. Say ID challenge. <laughs> Profiling backfires, how to accurately assess behavior, how to treat juvenile de delinquents the right way, how to not become a criminologist no one can trust, five things you should never do when you are analyzing crime trends, three rookie mistakes new officers make, five biggest social stratification mistakes and what you can do about them. Warning, knowing juvenile delinquency theories will make or break you. Three questions you should ask before you understand the history of juvenile justice. Five mistakes you don't want to make when want to make when counseling and treating juvenile delinquents. Three major mistakes most reform and policy experts continue to make and five things that will trip you up in legal issues. All right, you know the drill. One minute to create your own title for your subject. It's still supposed to be catchy, is that the idea? Yes, it's supposed okay. to be catchy because students are supposed to say, ooh, dang, that's so good, I have got to be there. Remember, we want that big juicy burger. This is your big juicy burger enticement title. class when branding backfires how to manage image crises it's actually a topic we're talking about this coming week uh, in response to number eight warning this project is worth 40 percent of your total grade hey that's a good fear tactic <laughs> to become an art program user. Okay. That was a Tron reference. Program user. <laughs> yeah. If we didn't get it. Okay. Yeah, nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. How to attach a waistband the right way. Oh, okay. Good. But, but all right. Warning, save. Save often. And know where you save to. Oh, yeah, that's oh my god, yeah. yeah. that yes. uh, Warning, a dynamite thesis statements ahead. Ooh, that, would go, that would make me, that would, yeah. Oh, that would be good. Okay. Three major mistakes those so cool. insurance <laughs> continue to make. Very good. Mm. All of these sound like such a good, I want to like sit in on all of your classes now, see? <laughs> versus nature arguments. If you knew more about human personality, it would shock you. Three unbelievable explanations for human intelligence. And why haven't students been told these facts about learning and cognition? Dear class, you're not going to believe the effect hormones have on a person's behavior. Okay, you got 
the drill, create your drama and theatrics subject enticement. Confessions of a fashion buyer. It is. It is. It's but uh, what's your name? Mercedes. Wow. Mercedes. Yeah, that's oh, great. Wow. Uh, in response to number five, dear Homer, you're not going to scare me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not clever. <laughs> you could have started with dear Jason. You could have added. <laughs> Just go with Trump. This is what's wrong. If you knew more about YouTube, it would terrify you. I <laughs> don't know YouTube. It does terrify me. <laughs> I went with number two. Uh, if you knew more about the cosmic power of color theory, it would bedazzle you. <laughs> That's a good one. That That's is funny. really good. <laughs> <That's a> good <laughs> <one>. <laughs> If you knew more about how fashion is manufactured, it would shock you. Probably true. Yeah. If you knew what? Confessions of a fine artist wannabe. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. It would shock you. Oh, yeah. Dear last minute panicking writer, you're not alone. <laughs> Confessions of a true interior designer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So can you see how possibly just taking these sentences and plugging in the topics that you already use in your class, either posting them in Jupyter, sending out an email, or even putting them in the outline of your, in your, of your syllabus can completely change the structure in just a tiny little way to make it sound so much more enticing and interesting. That they don't want to miss out. I guess, I guess that's, that brings up an interesting point. And, uh, so I, I, I guess this is when we were taught, I guess maybe, but you know, the syllabus was always this very stolid, rigid thing, very serious, you know, no joking around, you know, pull up your, your panties and let's focus, and, uh -huh. you know. But the way you're suggesting it, it's like, well, maybe we're taking it too seriously and we can go in there and add a little sense of humor to, to it all. Yeah, I don't yeah. see why not. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of this brings it back to one's personality. Because, man, I can rock the syllabus with personality. I just didn't think it would be appropriate. <laughs> seriously? Yeah, seriously. I was under a misconception. That's... You had to be, like, super serious academic. Let's not joke around. I, I don't see any I, like, I look at it as, as though I'm doing stand-up. <laughs> see, that's <laughs> really bad. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, I, I, I have to confer on the... The first part, but not the last part. <laughs> like I think I'm really good at it. <laughs> 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 I'm very lame when it comes to subject when I go through. It. Isn't it? Isn't it kind of a performing art? It is. Yeah. It is. Absolutely. Like being on stage. It is. It very sure it is. Well, I was no, thinking I like these are before. like you have a title like this that you have to go into class and be like. Oh my gosh, have you guys ever heard about this thing called a thesis statement? I'm gonna tell you. And right. it's like you have to like actually you gotta deliver kind of deliver the title. Right. You yeah. sit in that classroom, right. don't you? Yeah. I make it sound like some dirty secret that I'm going to tell like you wouldn't believe what Freud would said about personality. Think about the Victorian Europe times. I mean, this was just like the biggest scandal. This is this thing called the Oedipus conflict. And you couldn't believe what he was going to say. I mean, it was really scandalous yeah. for the time. Yeah. And so, yeah, that makes them think, oh, I want to hear the scandalous story. Yeah. <laughs> tell me the juicy gossip. 
Okay. So now that we have our opening act down and how we're going to entice them to come, let's get them prepared for this session. So tell them to come with at least one burning question. They know the topic, they've read the chapter. What is something that they absolutely want to know in the content? What this does, it helps them know that you care about what they have to say. Also, take the students' questions in the first two to three minutes of class. Um, it's kind of like one of those scenarios that like, uh, with like raffle tickets, you have to be present to win, and if you're not there, you don't get the prize. Now, let's be real. If students have a question, there's not a situation in which we're not gonna answer a student's question. But this creates the value of being there at the beginning of class. This creates the scenario to make them seem like if you want your questions answered, it's only gonna be within the first two or three minutes. And so you're creating that atmosphere. Let's be real, you're probably still gonna answer the questions, but create the environment that makes it seem like that's the time you get your questions answered. And another way that you can do this is you must be here to hear it. So if, if, consider including some information that is only going to be shared during class time. They're not gonna be able to get it from their textbook. They're not gonna be able to get it from Jupiter. They're not gonna be able to get it via email. It has to be present to win kind of situation. So what are some things that you would include in, um, in class time only? Well, one is maybe a time or theory that didn't work. So maybe, you know, share a personal story, which makes us vulnerable. And I'm gonna tie us back to our social emotional learning that we did last time with that in just a moment. But maybe share a time when something didn't work out. For example, I'm about to teach a human resource class here. And so maybe I share a time with my students in which um, I had to write an employee up and it didn't go as planned and uh, the situation exploded. You can also provide information about upcoming yeah. workshops that would help them grow professionally. You could share with them a conversation that you have with a colleague on a topic, or you could share why you disagree or agree with a particular theory. You could also add what you think is missing from the content or concept. So for example, what did the author forget to include in the textbook about a certain topic? And then lastly, you could uh, provide a professional example, and this is kind of closely tied to the first bulletin point. So um, it's just kind of your personal point of view. And one thing that I've noticed is students want to hear what your personal experience have been. People like stories, you know? And oftentimes, even if they don't have a story about something, I'll make one up, yeah. you know? If, if either that or something a professor has told me, I'll make it my own. I'll tell it like it's my story. People like stories, they relate to stories. So does anyone know what FOMO is? Fear, fear of missing, missing out. out. Yeah, fear of missing out. So people do not like to think that they're missing out fear on something. So even if, um, even if you post an email or announce this, that you're gonna be sharing a story in class um, for example, I was like, I, on the, one of the first days when we're about to talk about psychological disorders, I tell, okay, when I worked at the Denton County Sheriff's Department, MHMR, there was a guy that used to lay in the middle of Loop 288 to take a nap, and he was involuntarily committed. If you want to hear that story, you better be here on Monday for Chapter 15. So they don't like that they may miss out on this big, gossip, juicy story that I'm going to share with them. This is too why social media is so addicting and so popular is people don't like to feel don't like to feel like they're going to miss out on something. All right. So I do want to take a moment to kind of back up and recap from our last workshop. We talked about social emotional learning. And remember, I stated that when students learn, they're very vulnerable. It's a very vulnerable time. Well, we need to be vulnerable too. And this is why um, sharing a theory or a time when something just didn't work out and work according to plan can be very impactful. It can be very powerful. So you know I'm always preaching about Brene Brown and her research on resilience and shame. Um, I want to show you a clip about her talking about vulnerability in education, and I kind of want to hear your thoughts on it because we've talked about the student side, but we have not talked about the educator side.
Are you seeing something? Is it in Press escape. is not weakness. And that myth is profoundly dangerous. I define vulnerability as emotional risk, exposure, uncertainty. It fuels our daily lives. And I've come to the belief, this is my 12th year doing this research, that vulnerability is our most accurate measurement of courage. We think about vulnerability as a dark emotion. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about light emo you know, positive emotions, negative emotions, dark emotions, light emotions. We think of vulnerability as a dark emotion. We think of it as the core of fear and shame and grief and disappointment, uncertainty, things that we do not want to feel, right? Things that I don't want to be vulnerable because that means I'm afraid, that means I'm uncertain, that means I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm at risk, I'm exposed, I'm, I'm in grief. So what we do is we armor up and we say, I do not want to slip into these dark emotions. I will not let myself be vulnerable. When you armor up, you armor up. In this hallway, you shut yourself off from everything that you do and that you love. Because vulnerability is certainly a part of fear and self-doubt and grief and uncertainty and shame, but it's also the birthplace of these. It's the birthplace of love, of belonging, of joy, trust, empathy, creativity, and innovation. Without vulnerability, you cannot create. So let me go on the record and say, Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. <laughs> to create is to make something that has never existed before. Yes. There's nothing more vulnerable than that. Adaptability to change is all about vulnerability. Imagine creativity and innovation without vulnerability. I'm asking you for a work product that has never been made before, is completely innovative, I need you to be creative, and then as you present it to a group of people who are gonna happily and think it's stupid and not understand it. No vulnerability there. It is not about winning, it's not about losing, it's about showing up and being seen. The second thing, this is who I want to be. I want to create. I want to make things that didn't exist before I touched them. I want to show up and be seen in my work and in my life. And if you're going to show up and be seen, there is only one guarantee, and that is you will get your ass kicked. <laughs> that is the guarantee. That's the only certainty you have. If you're going to go in the arena and spend any time in there whatsoever, especially if you've committed to creating in your life, you will get your ass kicked. So you have to decide at that moment, I think for all of us, if courage is a value that we hold, this is a consequence. We can't avoid it. The third thing, which really set me free, and I think Steve, my husband would argue, has made me somewhat dangerous, is kind of a new philosophy about criticism, which is this. If you're not in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. <laughs> information feedback to give me, I want it. And I'm an academic, I'm hardwired for wrestling around with stuff like that. Just, hey, you forgot all this literature, or hey, you should have done this, or terrible sentence construction over here. Like, let's go, let's, let's do it. I love that. But if you're in the cheap seats, not putting yourself on the line, and just talking about how I could do it better, I'm in no way interested in your feedback. And I know it's seductive to stand outside the arena because I think I did it my whole life and think to myself, I'm gonna go in there and kick some ass when I'm bulletproof and when I'm perfect. And that is seductive, but the truth is, that never happens. 
And even if you got as perfect as you could and as bulletproof as you could possibly muster, when you got in there, that's not what we want to see. We want you to go in. We want to be with you and across from you. And we just want for ourselves and for the people we care about and the people we work with to dear greatly. So thank y'all very much. I really appreciate that. All right, so we've talked a lot about from the student side of vulnerability and learning, but from the instructor side, what did you take away from her as an educator and being vulnerable? Preach what you practice. Any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Preach what you practice. Okay. That's, the bottom line is, to, yeah, you know. Oh, you can't, you can't expect students to expose themselves if you're not willing to expose yourself to yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a huge, huge thing. If you go in there with this, like, I'm perfect mentality, what kind of innovation, creativity, empathy, relationship is going to be formed? Yeah. yeah. We have to be authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Again, That's back to personality. Yeah. It's all about yeah. like one's personality and the best fit of personality. Well, too. I don't think it really depends on personality. You can be authentic to who you are, and other people see that and they trust you. So, yeah. I, you know, nice. I can't go in and, and be like you. There's no way. I don't have that that you know that wit that you have. And so I'm not. I can't be that funny and you know like you do. Like yeah, like you know you me. Do. Yeah. Oh, so I can't do that. <laughs> but I can go in and be authentic in who I am so that the people trust me. So we're all different, but when we're authentic, then it builds trust. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's taking the tools that we have been provided and using that vulnerability to form those relationships. And that's why I really liked this one. I, I hadn't really given that much thought of giving examples to a class of times things didn't work out, um, but I really liked that. relatable it makes you a real human being and so that's why I really love um, kind of her take on it and even the part where she was just like only 50% care and I know a lot of us especially in general ed ed education courses they don't want to be there they don't understand why they have to take an English class or a speech class and so that creates another obstacle of making them find the relevancy of actually engaging and being part of the class yeah. I found, um, like in some of my, like especially the construction classes, sometimes I'll sit down and we'll mess up. And it's a good opportunity to say, you know what, look, it just happened to me. So I'm oh, sure you have. Oh. Right. Yeah. Right. So oh. I, you, the first time I did it, I was like, oh my God, I messed up. Every right. time and I now it's been, it's <laughs> been a good learning opportunity, I think, for them to, you know, see what that falls for. I just did it today. I told my students, I said, uh, so look, you can flip the board over and you can practice doing this on the back of the board to test out your theory before you apply it to the front. And then I flipped the board back over and everything I had just done smeared and smudged everywhere. I was like, oh look, this is what not to do. It makes you a real human. And that's yeah. what they love. They want to see that you're a real human too. Yeah. I, um, I was just, oh. Go ahead. No, I was just talking to one of the other professors about this like last week and he was saying that um, he's just done some professional development that's talked about like this kind of vulnerability and that he used to go into class and think that if he didn't know the answer to something that that was a big problem that you know he was going to be judged by students and things like that but I mean obviously if you have no idea what's going on then it's a problem but the idea of saying like yeah, actually I'm going to get back to you on that next class is not something you have to be afraid of as a professor yeah. you know that you can admit oh actually I need to do more research you know See, I, there, there's times like situations like that might arise for me in a lecture-based class and I'm like this is 2020 soon we're almost on 2020 and the technological advances are so rapid fire I'm like let's find this out now well, somebody, yeah. can you look this up for me now and oh yeah we've done that too I do that all yeah I do that a lot yeah that so, I want to know I want to know in the know yeah so like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's like, I'm interested too students yeah. can teach yeah. you like they're like oh I'm on the Wikipedia page I can tell you about yeah. whatever person we were talking about yeah yeah I, I enjoy that I do too. more today than I did when it first started <laughs> that was more thin than 10 years ago but yeah. today it's like it's the way of the world yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. let's find out together we can all grow yeah, and learn together. together I love it it's beautiful so 
let's look at three nonsense ways to organize class and interact with students. So we've got our opening app, we got them there, we have them engaged. So some other ways that we can do that is shine the light. We all know that people like to be praised. And so if you uh, want to reinforce the behavior you want, maybe the first person that shows up to class, the first one to ask a really good thought provoking question, first one to turn in the assignment, it's the same thing going back to that raffle ticket, the we have to be present to win, and people like public recognition. So find behaviors that you want to reinforce, that you want other students to do, and praise those, give, give them a light for that. Also, explain the rules of the game. It is important that you explain in the classroom setting that they're supposed to be adding to the learning experience that you're not the only one up at the microphone, that they are expected to pose meaningful questions, to connect their comments to the textbook, um, and that you expect them to answer other people's questions as well. Basically, you're saying to them, I expect you to be there physically and mentally. You're not just gonna show up and keep a seat warm. You need to be an active participant. That's the rules. And then use an easy pattern of organization. So I would like to offer up a really easy pattern. Lecture, engage, recap. Lecture, engage, recap. So lecture, surprisingly, should only be about 10 minutes. Okay, everyone's <gasps> No, lecture should only be about 10 minutes. So um, remember, we want the microphone to be turned back around on them. So when you engage students, actually stop talking and let them demonstrate understanding. Although you could probably cover this material in your sleep, you do it all day, every day, you know the ins and out of it, it is brand spanking new to them. So give them the opportunity to stop, digest, put it in their own words, ask questions, to, re to really um, engage and um, funnel the information back that you just told them. If you don't do this, this is like trying to drink water from a fire hose. I mean, it's just completely overwhelming. You have to give them the opportunity to stop and engage. Otherwise, it's completely overwhelming. And what did you accomplish? You covered the material, but you did not facilitate learning. So, and then the last part is the recap. So this is confirming understanding. So basically you're putting a nice pretty bow on the finished project. So lecture, engage, recap. So we just covered the four lobes of the cerebral cortex and the importance of this is X, Y, Z. So that's my recap. So how are some ways that you're currently engaging and recapping when you uh, teach? At the beginning of every new lecture, we I begin typically uh, begin by uh, with a summary of what we covered the week before, yeah. and I, I do that though in the form of a Q and A, okay. where I encourage uh, I'll ask the students, all right, so what did we talk about last week, and then, then it goes from there, you know, specific yes. questions and all that. But, That's fantastic. I do that too, actually, uh, to recap because I only you know see them once a week, and so you know seven days is a long time. So tell me what we talked about last time. That's kind of how I spark the instructor the discussion. Occasionally, I can, I ask them a specific question just to see if they know the answer. Yeah, yeah. That's a phenomenal way to really um, recap and re and engage. Any other ways that you're currently using in class? Well, uh, again, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to. Try to show mode here uh, but anyway during the le my lectures last way more than 10 minutes so <laughs> so like I provide lots of visuals and even supplemental videos and at the like, for example at the end of a I don't know 15 minute video uh, we'll have a QA and a where we'll have a discussion about the video and I'll say well, what do you think about that you know that kind of and that's kind of breaking it up. I mean, I I definitely um, in a three hour class probably lecture way more than once, but I do like a 10 minute lecture over maybe um, one of the objectives and then I engage them. So I ask them questions about things that we just covered. And then maybe we do an in-class activity to help recap it, or maybe I just do a quick summary over it. I know with the brain, that's a lot of information, the neuroanatomy piece. So I kind of go through the functions um, of the brain, like maybe we'll start with the uh, limbic system. And so I go through all the limbic system, I'll tell them different memory tricks, and then I'll put up a picture of the limbic system and I'll be like, okay, what's this part? 
and then that's my way for me to engage them to get them to repeat back basically what I just told them and then we do a recap on it so yes there's different ways that you can do it and of course there's going to be probably more than just a 10 minute lecture and a three hour class um, but it's breaking it up it's breaking up you don't want a long-winded hour and a half where you are the only one on the microphone and no one else says a word for that hour and a half that is way overwhelming especially when it's brand new material. If, uh, if, if students do particularly well on a, a lecture quiz and I like their answer, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll read them wrong. I'll that share can, it with the group. That goes back to the shine the light, which is a phenomenal oh, right. way to, yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great tool to use. Do you make a distinction between lecture and demonstration? Lecture is what I think of like the traditional classroom where I stand up here at the podium and I talk and it's just me talking. I think like, does she does if, I'm, if I'm showing you product, how to make, how to give an object line quality, mm -hmm. is that I, I, I kind of think it's more engaging when you're doing that. I would that's that's more to an out for me. I would tend to agree because that is going to allow for more for a Q and A compared to me just standing up here with a microphone. That allows for more Q and A individual interaction. Do it at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank Sometimes. you. I draw a lot on the board in okay. addition to the slides that we're going over yeah. to show what we're talking about and how to change it up or whatever else draw it on the board. Oh, That's a great idea too. you know what I've done? I've almost forgot about this. Uh, just for fun, uh, um, you know what uh, foot binding is? Yes. It's yes. awful looking. Uh, yeah. So the sometimes Japanese. I'll just, uh, in the middle, yeah, just, uh, well, is it Japanese? Chinese. 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 Anyway, uh, in the middle of a presentation on McCartney's tree or something, I'll just throw in some random slide, and if it, I'll just be quiet, and they'll be like, uh, <laughs> yeah, just to make sure they're awake, you know, that kind of thing. That's what does this really have to do with printmaking? Like, <laughs> a theatrics piece, throwing a random picture to see if someone's paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the closing credits. So keeping the momentum going after class. So let me show you some tips that I have for keeping the momentum going. I know that a lot of you have kind of shared some things that would be great and really relevant to you. One is through a blog or an announcement. So in my platform, we use Canvas and there's like an announcement area. So I will post like maybe some additional resources that they can, that they can go and look at and they can comment like right below about it. And so it can sparks that like outside discussion of the class and expands on things that were not particularly maybe objectives, but things that they find really interesting. For example, in psychology, everyone's like lucid dreaming, lucid dreaming. So I'll go and I'll post an article about lucid, and we can talk about that outside because really that's not one of the objectives of the class. Another one is through email. So I know a lot of you have mentioned that you provide follow-up material, additional resources or podcasts or YouTube videos that they can watch to get more clarification. And that's fantastic. And the beauty of it is, is if you teach this class over and over again, you have the template. Send that out the very next time. Also, another one that I have found to be really relevant is to tell students to go share this information with someone that is not in their class. So um, either that or someone of a different generation. And what that means is if they're able to tell someone else about the content they learned in the class, they learned it. If they can really fully explain it to someone else, then that demonstrates learning. And so then what I do is I have them in the next class period, who did you share your information with? And maybe they say my mom. And I said, okay, what'd you tell her? And that helps recap that information of what they actually learned the previous class period. And that kind of kicks off the next conversation. And then um, highlighting. So we already kind of mentioned this, highlighting a student. Um, this is going to encourage those behaviors that you want to see continue and hopefully uh, motivate other students to engage in those behaviors and, as well. And then lastly, offer up a tease. And so, um, you know, I told you with like my Freud being scandalous, but what I do personally is I make every day sound like the most important day ever. So before the semester starts, I send out an email to them and I say, okay, in the first day of class, we're gonna cover chapter one, which is like the overview of psychology, it goes through all um, the major theories and it also causes, uh, covers all the important history, history people in psychology. We'll also be going through policies and procedures. You definitely don't wanna miss the first day, otherwise you're gonna be completely lost. But guess what? In the first day I tell them, okay, 
Next week, we're covering research methods. If you don't know how to read psychological research, you're gonna be lost the entire semester because all of these articles are not gonna make sense to you. Next one, I'll say, <laughs> next is neuroanatomy. We're covering the brain. The brain comes up in every single chapter for the rest of the semester. If you don't understand the foundation of the brain and the functions, you're gonna be completely lost. So every day is the most important day ever. <laughs> And so that's a, a great way to kind of factor up those teases as well. So I know we're just about out of time, but um, what are some ideas that we covered today that kind of lit up for you that you think you could implement in your class? The titles. The titles. Yeah, let's TVize it. <laughs> I love it. I think I'm definitely going to try and keep a more consistent like follow up to classes because I fit like I when I do it like it's you know. It's interesting we can talk about it later, but I don't do it consistently every single week. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just kind of getting into that new routine, that new pattern. And I, you know, I'd be curious to know, like, if you did implement this for a semester, like, did it change your attendance rates? Did people show up on time? Like, I would be curious to know the statistics behind if uh, this implementation really did assist. So yeah. what I've been doing is I've been getting through my going through my lecture and then doing the supplemental videos. But I think uh, from now on, what I'm going to do is break it up. Yeah. I'm going to try that instead of just plowing through. Like, okay, we finished this part. Now let's watch the video that supports it. Maybe even do a Q and A discussion and then move on. I love it. Mm -hmm. Those are some great ideas. Really you, you mentioned FOMO, uh -huh. and one of the issues that I I experienced is handheld computers. And, and the fact that they're such a distraction. So I, I practice JOMO, uh -huh. which is the joy of missing out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so when you tell your students? Right. JOMO, the right. right. most yeah. success. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> JOMO on that phone so you can FOMO here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's a little funny. Add that to your syllabus. That's a, <laughs> That's a policy in Mr. Webster's class. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anything else that you want to add? All right, well, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.